The following is a compilation of some of my favorite videos I have made on my favorite God of the Western left-hand path. And that God is Odin. There is so much more to the left-hand path than just Satan or Lucifer. Some mythological characters we're all familiar with can also fill the qualifications of what it is to be a left-hand path deity. To begin with, and as I've stated in more than one video, I don't like to just scratch the surface. I like to dig. I am a seeker after knowledge, and the more secretive or clandestine that knowledge, the better. I like to hunt, if you will, to uncover mysteries. I want to get at the roots, the foundation, not only from a historical perspective, but also the psychological and mythological. This is one of the reasons why I named the Left Hand Path organization I founded, the Sect of the Horn God. The Horn God is ambiguous. Who this Horn God is is left open for you to fill in the blanks, for you to put that face on the archetype, that face that best suits you. Now, the modern pagans will insist the Horn God is Kernanos, and they know all about him. He's the boy toy of the much superior goddess. Goddess with a capital G. I call bullshit. Even though I've often used the name Kernanos when referring to the Celtic horn god, no ancient Celt ever called his god by that name. The word Kernanos is Latin for the horned one. It's what the Romans called this god for his true name or names are lost to antiquity. But there's another horned god that very much fits within the pantheon of sinisterous divinities that you may not be familiar with or, or at least in this guise. His name is Vodanaz. Now, Odin, Wotan, Votan, the Norse Allfather, Master of Runes, we've heard of him before. And in the realm of comparative mythology, he's been linked to many other great Indo European deities, such as the Slavic horn god Valis, Lu of the Celts, the Roman god Mercury, Hermes of the Greeks, Thoth of the Egyptians, and as I've presented in a recent video, Rudra of the Hindus and Avatar of Shiva. And in that video I mentioned how he was originally a lesser god from outside Scandinavia that over time eventually became Odin the Odin we know. But how did he usurp the crown to become chief of the Germanic Norse pantheon and what are his connections to the left-hand path? Roughly 2,000 years ago, the Germanic tribesmen of Northern Europe had a sky god called Tiawaz or Tiavaz, a precursor to the Norse god Tyr. Besides being a sky god, having much in common with Zeus and Jupiter, he was also synonymous with Mars, for the ancient Germans were a warrior culture. Now, on the outskirts of Germanic society was a warrior caste, trained to fight from adolescence and nighttime raids. These elite stealth fighters partook in mind-altering occult rituals to appease the dead and to become one with such creatures as wolves and bears. These were the Hari, the ghost warriors, and according to 1st century CE Roman historian Tacitus,
In Vodanas was their god, a barbaric god of the wild hunt, storms, and secret or occult knowledge. And with the encroachment of the Roman Empire, a god had to step up, come to the fore. Now, in Celtic Irish mythology, the king of the gods, Nuada, lost his hand in battle, thus, Lu stepped forward. This symbolized that the people had to switch deities or archetypes to one that better suited their needs. According to the prose Edda, a similar thing happened when the great wolf Finrir bit off Tyr's hand at the wrist. Tyr, or Tiawaz, does this voluntarily, some saying this symbolized the Germanic tribesmen's need for more severe measures when dealing with the Romans. Thus, the savage god of the Hari, Vodanaz, replaced Tiawaz, for he was a better suited god for their needs. Hence, the origin of Odin as Allfather. But it's more than these dark origins that make Odin a lord of the left-hand path. At the center of the Norse cosmos stands the great tree Yggdrasil, which grows out of the well of Erd, a pool whose depths hold many of the most powerful forces and beings in the cosmos. Among these beings are the Norns, maidens who shape fate by carving runes into the great tree's trunk. These powerful symbols then carry their intentions throughout the tree, affecting everything in the nine worlds. Odin envied this power and was bent on coming to know the runes. Since the runes do not reveal themselves to any but those who prove themselves worthy of fearful insights and abilities, Odin hung himself from a branch of Yggdrasil pierced himself with his spear and peered downward into the shadowy waters below, calling for the runes, forbidding any of the other gods to help him. He lingered in this state for nine days and nights, and on the end of the ninth night, he at last perceived shapes in the depths, the runes. They had accepted his sacrifice revealing to him not only their forms, but also the secrets that lie within them. Thus, Odin became more knowledgeable and more powerful, and he did this by self-sacrifice. Some have speculated that he must have sacrificed himself to an unnamed greater god, but those who follow the left-hand path will recognize who that god was. That God was himself. He is his own God. And what better defines the left-hand path? This story of Odin shows us that to reach self-deification, one must sacrifice their time and effort and be willing to stare into the abyss to obtain the secret knowledge, to become the God within. Odin of the Aesir, the ultimate seeker after sacred knowledge. He became a master of Sather, uh, form of Norse magic generally associated with the feminine arts. And in Norse society, for a man to engage in such arts could bring scorn. Even Odin was an exempt from such charges of unmanliness and was taunted for adopting feminine traits. It's also said that Odin's superior 
poetic skills are due to him stealing the mead of the scalds or poets by sleeping with the giantess, Gunluth, guardian of the mead. What happened was that after spending three nights with the giantess, she offered him three sips of mead, three sips only. This is where Odin's trickster side came out. Instead of abiding by her wishes, he chugged down the full horn before shape-shifting into an eagle and getting the hell out of there. But the ultimate expression of Odin's thirst for knowledge was when he sacrificed himself to himself upon Yggdrasil to obtain the wisdom of the runes. Now, at the center of the Norse cosmos stands the great tree Yggdrasil, which grows out of the well of Erd, a pool whose depths hold many of the most powerful forces and beings in the cosmos. Among these beings are the Norns, maidens who shape fate by carving runes into Yggdrasil's trunk. These powerful symbols then carry their intentions throughout the tree, affecting everything in the nine worlds. Odin, being that ultimate seeker after knowledge and master of the occult, envied this power and was determined to know the runes. Since the runes do not reveal themselves to any, but those who prove themselves worthy of fearful insights and abilities, Odin hung himself from a branch of Yggdrasil, pierced himself with his spear, and peered down into the shadowy waters below, calling for the runes, forbidding any of the other gods to help him. He lingered in this state for nine days and nights. And on the end of the ninth night, he at last perceived shapes in the depths, the runes. The Norns had accepted his sacrifice, revealing to him not only the runic forms, but all the secrets that lie therein. Thus, Odin became more knowledgeable, more powerful. And he revealed the secret of the runes to humankind. One of the major themes of this channel is why do we do this? Why do we, any of us, delve into the esoteric, the occult? What is it on a deep psychological level that compels us to not only be seekers after knowledge, but do so in a manner that's wrought with danger? The tales of Odin, the greatest god of the Western left-hand path traditions, may help us in answering that question. But Mythology is often ignored in modern society, considered quaint little stories from a brutal and ignorant past. Those who believe this miss the point. Myth is more than simple storytelling. It's, it speaks the language of the soul. It conveys messages understood in the deeper reaches of our psyches. But Unfortunately, most of the ancient myths we know today have been filtered through the good, bad, light, dark Christian interpretation. And Odin is no exception. Most see him as some Norse Yahweh. This is because of the 13th century Icelandic writer Snorri Sturluson who injected some of his Christian biases into the mythos. But, in truth, Odin has little in common with the god of Abrahamus. For Odin is a very dark god. 
Odin of the Aesir has the most varied characteristics of just about any god, for he's not only the god of war, but also of poetry, of the dead, of runes, of magic, and the ultimate seeker after dark knowledge. This fact is revealed in his association with the dead. Example, it's said that Odin awakened a dead Volvo or sorceress to learn the secrets of his son Baldur's nightmares. Also, to obtain wisdom, he plucked out one of his eyes and presented it as a token so he could drink from the wise advisor Mimir's well. It's written in the prose Eddas that Odin's immense knowledge is courtesy of that same Mimir's decapitated head. After the Vanir had chopped off Mimir's head, they sent it to Odin, who, by using dark magic and healing herbs, kept it from decaying, so Mimir could continue to forward secrets to him from the other world. Odin also gained sacred knowledge from Freya, who taught him Seder, a form of Norse magic generally associated as a feminine art. It's also said that Odin's superior poetic skills are due to him stealing the meat of the skalds or poets by sleeping with the giantess Gunluth, guardian of the mead. What happened was that after fucking the giantess for three straight nights, she offered him three sips and three sips only. Odin, though, being who he is, chugged down the full horn before shape-shifting into an eagle and getting the hell out of there. But the ultimate expression of Odin's thirst for knowledge is when he sacrificed himself to himself to learn the secret of the runes. For nine days and nights, he hung from Yggdrasil, the world tree with a spear wound that brought him to the brink of death, but put him in an altered state of consciousness before the runes revealed themselves to him. Now, why did, why did Odin do all this? Why was his desperation for knowledge so great? It's because of Ragnarok, the final battle of the gods. Odin knew that someday he was going to die, be devoured by the giant wolf Fenrir. But maybe, just maybe, if he searched hard enough, he could obtain the knowledge that could alter his fate to become immortal. Is this the same reason why we do what we do? We know that someday we'll die, that we'll have our own Ragnarok. Are we trying to defeat death through occult knowledge to become immortal in one fashion or another? Odin's hard-fought quest for knowledge is a perfect example of what you need to do on the left-hand path because nothing worthwhile in life comes easily. We have to sacrifice, but when we do, it's not to something outside us, but instead to ourselves. I've done a few videos on comparative mythology and the links between East and West. And this time it's the connection between Rudra of the Hindus and Odin of the Norse, and where they meet on the left-hand path. First, Rudra. Anyone who performs a function of destruction participates in the Rudra principle. Life, which can only exist by destroying life, is a manifestation of Rudra. What is the meaning of this quote? Does it mean to kill your neighbor or partake in human sacrifice? 
Rudra is a terrible god, a god of violence and destruction. Does this mean brutal force is the eternal answer to the evolution of humankind, to the growth of human intellect? To understand who Rudra is, one must first understand Shiva. Shiva is more than just a god sometimes viewed from a left-hand path perspective. He is also darkness, that which is not manifested. He is not of substance. Substance stops light. He is what most of reality is, that space between the stars. Light is not eternal. All things that generate life will sometime in the future burn out, be it a candle, a bulb, or even a star. Darkness, though, darkness is eternal. Darkness is greater than light, for it was already there before light arrived. In Shiva is the divine darkness. Shiva is the black sun behind the sun. He is one with the deity Carl Jung identified as Abraxas, the eternal sucking gorge of the void. So, who's Rudra? Rudra is the roar out of that darkness. According to the Vedas, Rudra, an avatar of Shiva, is the spirit of nature associated with storms, war, and the wild hunt. He is one that the other gods are frightened of, of his violent ways and his desire for destruction. Thus, every single being, divine or mortal, fears Rudra. Besides Rudra's temperament being a representation of nature's most ruthless forces, such as lightning, wind, and wildfires, he is also the equivalent to Nietzsche's will to power. And in his anthropomorphic form, Rudra is lord of the animals, thus making him one with Pashupati, the horn god. His affinity for animals is a reflection of Rudra's station outside of society. In the Vedas, you'll find Rudra separated from the other gods in certain rituals, and instead you'll find him with the malevolent spirits and deities. He is lord of ghosts, known to lurk about graveyards. And in a more furious guise, he gives sinners the tortures of hell. Rudra is death, the demon, the cause of the tears, the god that kills. Now, even though Rudra seems to stem from a pre-Indo-European tradition, the comparison between he and the Norse god Odin cannot be denied. For like Rudra, Odin is a fierce, destructive god associated with storms, war, and the wild hunt. And going deeper, Odin's Germanic equivalent is the god Wotan. It is said that the name Wotan comes from the old Germanic word Vuth, meaning rage or wrath. But another meaning is to penetrate or force one's way through all opposition. Therefore, Wotan, or Odin, can be translated as the all-penetrating, the all-conquering spirit of nature. Now, the most ancient traces of Odin suggest that he came from outside Northern Europe and was a god that led the souls of the dead into the afterlife. But as his fame and influence spread northward amongst the Germanic peoples, he became associated with war and heroic deeds. And like Rudra, Odin has had problems with the other gods. Even though he is the Allfather, some Norse traditions allude to tales in which the gods kept Odin out of their realm for years so that they may not be tarnished by his dangerous ways. So, what do these two, 
Rudra and Odin mean to us on the left-hand path where we, where we already have such deities such as Satan and Lucifer. Truth is, from a mythological perspective, Satan and Lucifer aren't really deities. A deity is a god, and they're not gods. They're the ex-employees of Yahweh. But don't get me wrong. This doesn't mean I don't hold these two in high esteem, because I do, for Western left-hand path traditions would not be what they are without them. It's just that Rudra and Odin are gods. Gods that when viewed from a left-hand path perspective are not ones you worship, but instead identify with, with what they represent. That roar out of the darkness. That roar coming from the God in you, calling you to that great self-overcoming. So, last Thursday, after binging on the standard Thanksgiving fare, I binged season one of the Netflix show Barbarians. I liked it. I give it a solid B. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically centered around the Battle of Teutonburg Forest, where in 9 AD, Germanic warriors destroyed one-tenth of Imperial Rome's fighting force many saying it was the worst defeat Rome ever suffered. Now, during the, during the battle, some of the, some of the warriors were depicted wearing black body paint, which in reality, some German barbarians were known to do. They were called the Hari, or ghost warriors, and the god of the Hari, whom I've mentioned before, was called Vodnaz, or Wodnaz later adopted by most German tribesmen and called Wotan, who eventually became Woden of the Anglo-Saxons and, of course, Odin of the Norse. You know, the, the All-Father, Master of Runes, God of the Wild Hunt, you've heard of him. And this deity leads us to the power of the archetypes and what happens when they're repressed, when they're ignored. Let me explain. As I've brought up before in more than one video, the repression of the shadow archetype or the demon is a bad idea. So too is the repression by a society or culture of the non-personal or collective archetype such as Votan. Votan is one of the masks or avatars of a greater archetype who's been known in, in other Indo-European pantheons as Valise of the Slavic people, Lou of the Celts, Mercury, Hermes, Rudra, etc. And with the smothering effect of the Christian influence in Europe, Wotan was repressed, put down in the psyche of the Germanic peoples. Beginning with the Enlightenment, and later with Darwin and many other great intellectuals of the 19th century, the Christian influence over Western civilization began to wane. Now, some of you might be saying, what the fuck are you talking about? Almost everything, almost everyone I know is a Christian. True, it's still the dominant religion here in the West, but compared to what it once was and its greater influence over governments, culture, and daily life, it doesn't compare. This is what Nietzsche was talking about when he said God is dead. He could see the, the Christian foundation and European society beginning to crumble and that all must be prepared for what was to come next. Not only was he weary of authoritarian political movements filling the void left behind by the death of God, 
you also sense the awakening of a sleeping God. In 1863 or 64, in his poem, To the Unknown God, Nietzsche wrote, I shall and will know the unknown one who searches out to the depths of my soul and blow through my life like a storm, ungraspable and yet my kinsman. In an essay written in 1936, three years before the start of World War II, Carl Jung could see the stirrings of the Wotan archetype in the German people. He wrote, It was not in Wotan's nature to linger on and show signs of old age. He simply disappeared when the times turned against him and remained invisible for more than a thousand years working anonymously and indirectly. Archetypes are like riverbeds, which dry up when the water deserts them, but which it can find again at any time. An archetype is like an old water course along which the water of life has flowed for centuries, digging a deep channel for itself. The longer it has flowed in this channel, the more likely it is that Sooner or later, the water will return to its old bed. In 1937, in Paris, a secret society of writers, artists, and intellectuals dared to create a combative energy to counter Wotan, whether they realized it or not. This was Asafel, a small, tight-knit organization of secret rituals and customs who gathered in the woods beside an oak tree that had been struck by lightning. There they would attempt to invoke the spirit of Dionysus. The logo of this society was a drawing of a headless man symbolizing Nietzsche's death of God. Founded by the writer Georges Bataille, Asafel dared to counter that which filled the void through a rebirth of Dionysian mysteries. They attempted to go somewhere deeper than the physical or psychological, for that matter, to the very realm of the archetypes themselves. They, they longed to awaken Dionysus from his sleep in order to battle against Wotan's authoritarian surge. But it was too little too late. What happened in Europe under National Socialism is a horrific example of what repression of the gods or archetypes can do. The problem here in the Western world is we view the gods as either literal or as quaint little tales told in the ancient past. And it's from these two perspectives that most argue, thus missing the point. The idea that anything could be real which doesn't come from the outside has hardly begun to seep into our feeble little brains. The gods are more than simple metaphorical beings there to stimulate our imaginations. They are the personification of psychic forces, and psychic forces have far more to do with the unconscious than the conscious. Thus. When they manifest, the outcome can be most dire. I am a mythology and history buff, so with the release of the new film, The Northmen, I can't help but feel the influence of one of my favorite gods, Odin, stir within me. And as expected, this film has also gotten the self-righteous shit disturbers making claims that it's a an example of latent white supremacy. We all knew this was coming, but more on that later. 
Now, getting back to Odin, I've done several videos on him and how he is not who most think he is. He is not the pleasant all-father Yahweh type king of the gods. Odin is a lord of the left-hand path. He is a dark god, neither good nor bad, but like all gods, a force and avatar of the archetype of the collective unconscious. But when the gods are shunned, ignored, especially a god with the attributes of Odin or Wotan, the reawakening can be catastrophic. Now, you might be on the left-hand path, but that doesn't mean there isn't something greater than you. Something beyond you, outside your field of influence. That would be your personal influence over the spiritual aspects of existence. Your attempt at bending the spiritual to your will. This may sound contradictory to the basics of a path that leads one to becoming their own God. But if you've set out to carve your path in a psychic wilderness, take heed of the weather, especially storms. There's more to the archetypes than them simply being universal patterns of behavior. They are sentient currents within a transcendental cosmos, who, when they make their presence known to the world, wear many different masks or faces. Hence, they are greater than you. And if certain archetypes are oppressed or ignored, when they eventually return, well, there can be problems. This brings us to Wotan and how his 1,000 year shunning led to the most horrific conflagration in human history. Carl Gustav Jung wrote in 1936, three years before the start of World War II, Wotan is the god of the storm and the frenzy, the unleasher of passions and the lust of battle. Moreover, he is a superlative magician and artist and illusion who is versed in all secrets of an occult nature. Jung also wrote, As an autonomous psychic factor, Wotan produces effects in the collective life of a people and thereby reveals his own nature. For Wotan has a particular biology of his own, quite apart from the nature of man. It is only from time to time that individuals fall under the irresistible influence of this unconscious factor. So, when did the archetype first put on this mask, the one we in the Western world are most familiar with? It begins with Vodnaz or Wodnaz, take your pick. He is a Germanic god that first reared his head roughly 2,000 years ago. A god of poetic fury and magicians, a god of war and death. He was not, though, the original chief of their pantheon. That was Tiawaz, later known as Tyr to the Norse, a sky god. But with the coming of the conquering Romans encroaching on their territory, a new god of the Germans was needed to take the reins of power. A more personal, powerful god, one with the knowledge of both war and magic. Now, a god of war makes sense because these people were about to do battle with the most powerful military of their age, but why magic, you may ask? because magic is a conduit to the subconscious. 
realized there was no science of psychology back then, so accessing the subconscious to build a psychic foundation was paramount to solidifying their general intellectual and cultural climate. And with magic, this can be done quickly. Over time, the cult of Wotan spread throughout Northern Europe, eventually resulting in his most well-known incarnation, Odin. But, as we all know, Christianity, or the Christ archetype, took dominion over the collective psyche of the Western world. Thus, Wotan was relegated to the shadows for 1,000 years. But with German unification in the 19th century, he reawakened slowly at first, but then fully by the 1930s. And his howl of wrath was not silenced until 1945. Does this then mean Botan is a god of hate, you may ask? And if one feels a pull toward him, then does that mean they're, uh, you know? No, of course not. The gods, the avatars of the archetypes are like the weather. Rain is necessary, but storms can be a problem. Over the past couple of months, I've made a few videos on shamanism, a fascinating topic, usually associated with the ancient indigenous cultures of the world. A spiritual practice where highly trained individuals commune with the spirit world through a symbolic death and rebirth for the purpose of healing or protection. But if someone's a black shaman, it could be for more sinister reasons. And shamanism has, in some form or another, been around for about 50,000 years. Now, it might surprise some, but there is a variation of shamanism in the Norse world, usually practiced by women called Sather. And the god of these shamanic practitioners was Odin, lord of the left-hand path. Odin's connection to shamanism is obvious when one considers his many travels to the underworld in search of answers from deities or the spirits of the dead. For example, Odin hanging from Yggdrasil is a form of shamanic ritual with his death and rebirth in order to gain knowledge. But the Northmen also had a distinctly male form of shamanism. These are the berserkers. First mentioned in a poem commemorating a Viking victory fought in 872, berserkers and Ufenards were warrior shamans, infamous for their ecstatic battle frenzy. The difference between these two groups, berserkers and Ulfenards, were their particular totem animals, berserkers the bears, the Ulfenards the wolf, Otherwise, they shared a common set of shamanic practices. It was said that these lycanthropic warriors of Odin had the ability to be possessed by their totem animals, obtaining the raw strength and fury of the beast. 
Despite being fierce warriors, they were known to be very spiritual, for it was common for them to postpone certain scheduled fights until some religious celebration passed. Also, when their lives came to an end and they were prepared for their funerals, they were wrapped in the furs of bears or wolves. Instilling fear in the hearts of their enemies was the number one weapon for the berserkers. Before battle, they would perform outrageous mannerisms such as biting their shields, chattering their teeth, and foaming at the mouth. They would often enter the fray clad only in animal skins, howling and running amok with demonic fury. Armed with either spear, battle axe, or sword, berserkers wreaked havoc, not only on the ranks of their foes, but sometimes friends as well. But we only have a vague notion as to how they acquired this beast-like trance state. A common hypothesis as to the source of their behavior is that the berserkers ingested a specific kind of psychoactive mushroom. However, the, the most probable explanation for going berserk may come from psychology instead of pharmacology. Psychologists believe that the spiritual rituals performed before battle, the drumming, dancing, and chanting, allowed them to go into a self-induced hysteria, which helped them to lose control. This put them into a dissociative state of mind, causing them to be motivated by their primal impulses thus allowing the berserkers to break free of social constructs which made them act more ruthless than any other warriors in history. This dissociative state caused by ritual shows some very real connections to shamanism as a whole. Mental transformation during initiation and trance allows the shaman to interact with the invisible forces, the ancestors, and obviously in the case of the berserkers and ufanars, the spirits of animals. This is in some ways also reminiscent of the Native American skinwalkers. According to legend, Navajo shamans would sometimes use their powers for evil, walking freely among the tribe during the day, but secretly transforming into beast under the cover of night. But before they could transform into a skinwalker, he or she must be initiated by performing the most evil of deeds, the killing of a close family member, most likely a sibling. After this task had been completed, the individual then acquired supernatural powers which gave them the ability to shapeshift into animals. The berserkers and Ufanards served many kings over the years, their overly aggressive nature earning them a place at, at the vanguard of the forces of the Northmen. In their wrathful state, they would break through the enemy lines, thus allowing the regular warriors to then charge through. The Berserker's lack of helmet and chainmail was, in itself, a good psychological weapon, naturally instilling fear in the opposing forces by showing a disregard for their own personal safety. In addition, the bare body may have symbolized a sense of invulnerability, thus displaying honor to Odin by dedicating their lives and bodies to the battle.
in 1066 at the end of the Viking era at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, it is suggested that a berserker fought for the Norwegian king Harald Hardrada against the English. Standing alone on the narrow bridge with a battle axe, he was unstoppable as he slaughtered those English that dared to challenge him. This carried on until an English warrior on a boat beneath the bridge thrust his spear upwards into the berserker's groin, killing him. But when it comes to the truth behind berserkers in history, there is, there is written evidence, but little archaeological evidence. It's true that with their wild reputations, they may come across as more mythological than real, the legend of the noble savage, if you will. The fact is, apart from their wildness and lack of armor, they are unlikely to seem much different than any other Viking warriors. But to you doubters, like I said, the written evidence is there. Also, animal furs, unlike armor, tend not to leave much archaeological evidence. 